All right, we're recording. We're live. Hey, Welcome hey. to OTXNT, OT Christ, the New Testament. Hey, Ben. <laughs> hey, well, I'll tell you, I think, yeah, I don't think we've ever really clarified that, that name, but, you know, I'm glad that we've done it now. So how are you doing? Hanging in, just living the dream. So <laughs> same here. I love Thursdays because the week's almost over. So it's my weekend starting today for you who are in still with full-time <clears throat> academia. Yours is not over, right? You've still got Friday. Yeah, I, I do try to reserve Friday for kind of odds and ends stuff. So, so it's, it's not as severe of a day unless I've messed up during the week <laughs> and I've got to make up ground. So that's my Thursday, man. Well, hey, you going to start us off the Lord's Prayer? Let's do it. Let's do it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Some point, I think maybe next week, you're going to have to deal with that. Let's we'll do some textual critical because I had people who watch. those are still like, I want to know what we do with those verses. So <laughs> we'll deal with them. Um, so this is one that I'm glad we're doing this one early because this is a passionate topic for me, um, which is really the Pentateuch and um, really trying to understand the, the Torah. And I'm going to use those interchangeably today in our discussion Pentateuch Torah, um, seeing it different than the way most people do, which is they just see it as a law book. Like, so let me throw it out to you, Andrew, when the way that at least that you would understand it or had been before you and I got exposed to John Salehammer's stuff, what was your basic understanding of the, the Torah? So, you know, I grew up actually in private Christian education and my, my parents, um, you know, my dad's a pastor. Uh, so, you know, these are the books of the law, you know. And so you just kind of assumed the books of the law and, and moved on. Really not much else was, was spent on that. You knew the Ten Commandments were in there somewhere. Somewhere. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's part of it is when we think of the law, most of the time, the Pentateuch, uh, the, and we'd say Pentateuch because it's, it's five scrolls is what it, it means. Um, but the Torah, right, it gets, it really, most people think of it, when they think of the Pentateuch, they think of Leviticus, and they think of just like the, all that legal material. And so most people say like, yeah, I, you know, it's just a bunch of outdated stuff. And they associate the whole Pentateuch with Old Covenant, which it encapsulates the old covenant, but they associate that it's, it's a relic of the old covenant and therefore kind of unnecessary for us as Christians today. Um, and that's something that uh, I think is very dangerous. And that's a whole nother discussion, by the way, Andrew, is yeah. at some point, maybe we do need to address, and I think we should, um, even just backing it up and the, the relationship that old has to the new. You know, we haven't even talked about that. And when you read stuff like um, what was it? The, the, I forgot what it was called. It was, and I've tried to forget it. Um, is the, the book where, uh, essentially Andy Stanley saying to unhitch, uh, the new Testament from the old Testament, uh, you know, and you look at that. And I think one of the fallacies he's got is he's seeing the whole old Testament as, as old covenant, uh, and unrelated. Um, and, and so that's a whole nother discussion to talk about at some yeah. point, um, irresistible. <clears throat> that was called. It was, it was cause I would stick a sticky note on it and call it resistible uh, <laughs> instead of. <laughs> uh, so, so here's the thing. So let's back it up. Let's talk about the Torah. Let's talk about the Torah in general um, and really what it is. So the, the basic understanding is it's, it's law, right? Um, but there's story, right? So when you think about the Torah, like what stories come to mind, Andrew? Uh, well, I mean, there's the whole gamut, you know, typically every year people try to start their read the Bible read the Bible in a year plan. And so we, we begin with Genesis creation story, maybe make it all the way to Abraham, skip some genealogies. Right. Uh, Most I, I people think, stop after Genesis, right? They're like, oh, I can't I, do it. I don't even think they finish it, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. I mean, if you get lucky enough to make it through uh, Exodus 19, you know, then, then it starts getting really heavy and, 
you know, all these chapters on building the tabernacle kick in. And I think that's the end of the read the Bible in a year plan for most of our members. Yeah, I think so. So here's one of the first premises of this whole thing that changes. So by the way, let me just say this. So um, I have been extremely influenced by a guy named John Salehammer. All my students know, and there you go, you're a good man. All my students know, uh, whenever they take me on the Pentateuch, um, it, it's, this is who I talk about. It, when you first met me, this is who I taught it because it changed everything for me. I took a Genesis class and blew my mind. So uh, a lot of what we're talking about today really comes rooted out of this book here. But let me show you something that's really interesting that if, if, because look, this is, this is a great book, by the way, Pentateuch is narrative, especially if you want like a commentary, because it, it's, it talks about the shape and the structure of the whole Pentateuch. And really the whole point is that it's actually a narrative. It's not meant to be a legal book. That's where this discussion comes out of today. Um, but um, if you want something that can kind of talk a little bit about that, boil it down and really focus on Jesus. Here's a cool one I've been reading. This is a whole nother discussion for another time. We'll talk more about it. It's a book that's called Reading Moses, Seeing Jesus. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. I think it was about 15 bucks. Uh, it's put out by, uh, if you've ever looked at uh, um, the uh, One for Israel YouTube channel, seen those videos, uh, this is one of Salehammer students, a guy named uh, Seth Postel. He was yeah. two classes ahead of me. Awesome, awesome, awesome book. Kind of a boiled down fact. I'm going to start using this in my classes on Pentateuch. So here's the thing. Here's how this goes. You know, we, we often think about the Pentateuch as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and we think of them as separate. Right. The, the truth is, I mean, when you think about, Andrew, like in the New Testament, a New Testament discussion of the Pentateuch <clears throat> usually discusses it as what? Well, I, yeah, I mean, the New Testament They call it what, though? Uh, the, the law, right? They call the, it the law, or they call it Moses said... Or right. the, the, the books of they, Moses, you know, as it is written in the, you know. But they see uh, it as a unified work. It's not like the, nobody ever quotes and says, this is from this one or this one or this one. Like right. the understanding, at least of the New Testament, is we're looking at a full unit of text, right? Yes. Yeah, I think that that's the, the crucial point, especially if you're trying to argue in favor of mosaic authorship, would be, well, Jesus seems to indicate it's all from the same hand, uh, not, not that Moses wrote some of it or um, yeah. the, the editor uh, in the school of Moses. You know, that, that is a foreign mindset to the New Testament. And so, yeah, they, they look at it as a, a key thing. And, and you kind of also see a rabbinic approach sometimes in the way that the exegesis is done, where you, you've got to have a reading established in the Pentateuch before we develop that out and then say what that's done in Christ. Yeah. So, so uh, that's the kind of the beginning premise is we need to understand and, and whether you're, wherever you're at on mosaic authorship, who cares? We can talk about that. You want to talk about that at some point. What I want to say is, is this a unit? Is this meant to be five separate books or was it meant to be understood as when they, for instance, when they call it the book of Moses, or when, when, and really you see this throughout the Old Testament, is when they talk about it, they call it the book. They call it the book of the law or the books of Moses, things like that. So um, that's what we see is it's, it was meant to be understood as a unified text. We know it was divided later on um, because of scroll space. I mean, you got to think about how big it is. Even the divisions in Hebrew, um, they, they, they're... The, the, the titles were never meant to be separate titles. Like in New Testament, even the titles we put, right? We, we, those are, they're arbitrary titles. They're not original to the text. Even in the Hebrew though, it was just like, hey, the, here's the first word of the text. Let's, that's how we divide it up. If we start uh, there. And so uh, that's one of the things that people, the first step in kind of trying to grasp what's going on is we've got to remember but this is a document start to finish. Genesis through Deuteronomy is a unified work. It's the unified work written by Moses. Um, when you get that, when you don't see it as a, a, you know, if you don't see it as five separate books, that becomes really a key point. And so let me explain how. 
because you you mentioned already we start reading in the narratives but we stop at 19 why do we stop at exodus why do you typically stop at exodus 19 so well exodus 20 is the 10 commandments so maybe you do the 10 commandments but then we get a listing of the laws right 20 21 yeah. 22 23 24 uh we have that moment where the people hear the book of the law they say we'll obey and moses sprinkles them with blood and then uh, then we have the golden calf, so maybe we get back into some narrative. But yeah, at that point in time, we we move more and more between narrative and law, narrative and law, and it's hard to stay interested. Um, yeah, I mean, if you if you're really devoted and you get to numbers, you know, then then you're really for a treat because you get to count <laughs> every family of every tribe, you know. So, but you know what, you see that in smaller pieces in Genesis too. Uh, you see these genealogical lists and things like that. So here's the basic premise, and this is what sold me on understanding really the, the narrative of the Pentateuch, is that there's a purpose, but the way that, that Moses is trying to write. See, a lot of time we just kind of look at it, here's a bunch of stories that start, then we get law, and it's a bunch of law. But it's, it's actually really interesting to see that th there's a purpose of who he focuses on, how he focuses on it. Um, and, and where we get. So for instance, you know, the, we start with the scene, right? So we got to go from the beginning. And so the beginning starts with creation. And um, it's really interesting to think about too. And this is what this is, a, you know, these are fun topics, but uh, the words that are used in the first two chapters of the creation narrative, right? Those are, uh, we, tech, we usually translate the word earth as earth and we think of the globe. But when you think about what is a major theme Andrew, as a, as a guy who's just, you know, this, I know this is not your area, but like you think about like in your mind, what's a major theme after essentially the, once you get to the Moses stories, what's a major theme for the people, um, where they're headed and what's coming for them? Uh, the promised land. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what we're, you know, Genesis is, do we have the people and the rest of it is, can we get the land? And, and that, that's, what it's all about, you know, and then we still don't have it at the end of the Pentateuch, but it's close, right? Well, and so, so with that theme in mind, if this is a unified work and really a thrust of it, right, is we're going to move people into the land. Isn't it interesting that the first two chapters talk about really the land? It's the same word that's used. And so, and it be starts in the land. It starts in this place where God lives amongst his people, um, Sin is introduced into, uh, and, and they're booted out. They're put out, by the way, eastward. And eastward is obviously uh, a, a kind of a reference to Babylon, uh, where they will go into exile. So they're, so, so to speak, in exile. In fact, um, Postel has his book, uh, uh, Adam as Israel. And it talks about that, that really it's a foreshadowing uh, so to speak, where it's a lesson to say what was going to come for Israel. Uh, but you know what's interesting thing? So we're talking about like themes and how they kind of grow together. I guess one of the first things we need to do, and it's sort of not, you know, we talk, when I talk to my students is, if, let's, let's kind of try to figure out what is the major thrust of the entire Pentateuch? Like what is the climax? If, as you've read through it, what is the climax of the whole book? Like where do we get to as the high point of the text? And then everything else kind of falls off after that. What's the, what's the major piece of it? Well, I, I'm not there sure. There are again, wrong you, answers. Don't you worry. Got me, you got me yeah. in the, uh, again, this is not my, this is not my area. Uh, but I, I, mean, I, I would assume that the giving of the law at Sinai would be the, the high point. Boom. You're absolutely right. Con <laughs> congratulations. In the words of my uh, college professor, he would often say, give yourself 10 points. And at the end of class, so I'd come expecting 10 points and realize they were all made up points. So, oh. uh, but here's the deal. You're absolutely right. The whole story kind of <clears throat> builds towards covenant and covenant with God, with these people, right? 19, chapter 19 is where he says, I will be your God. You'll be my people. Uh, you're going to be my kingdom of priests. And so everything is building up towards that. So it's an interesting thing about uh, about kind of where we want to go with this. And it appears that at least in the, you got to follow the storyline, right? So this is a, a storyline that's taking place. So let's get there now. And then we'll go back and say, what do we do with some of this law? Okay. There's a storyline, right? So we get to the, 
we get to Genesis chapter three, the fall happens. Now this is one area you are very knowledgeable in with this promise that's given. This promise that's given of the seed. Yeah, okay? Yes. Now that one that's picked up in the New Testament, um, and, but it's significant in the Old Testament. It's more implicit in what's going on in the Old Testament, especially the Pentateuch. But the seed, according to Paul, is, is, is how significant is that promise in Genesis yeah. 3? Well, and then, of course, this gets into my dissertation, which was, you know, looking at how Paul, uh, Paul's hermeneutics and how he understands the, the seed. Because in Galatians chapter 3, he says that the seed is singular. Um, it's not seeds, plural, or offsprings, plural, but singular, and that is Christ. And of course, that you know is a an issue uh, for modern uh, scholarship. Does Paul is is Paul theolog uh, theologizing here? Uh, is he trying to uh, make something out of nothing, or is he trying to really exegete the text? And so that that's what I explored. But yeah, the the seed promise Genesis three fifteen uh, Genesis four. I've given you Seth to replace uh, the seed of uh, Abel. And then uh, the seed is just traced through all the genealogies. And, and so when I said Genesis is about getting the people, we're looking at that seed. And of course, uh, one of those crucial passages in this whole discussion, which we shouldn't get into today, which is Onan and, uh, and how that and the tribe of Judah plays in. And that'll usually get picked up again in Ruth. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. We finally get the people in Genesis, but then we always go back to the promised Abraham, which is land, great number of descendants and land. And then I would say within that is built in the one who will come from yeah. the body. So you've so. got these themes, right? So you've got a theme of this blessing to this people, but what's it for? It's to, so through the seed, right? Is I'm going to bless you and through your seed will bless the nations, correct? Right. And so there is this redemptive story that takes place. They're booted out. God still is with them. He doesn't wipe them out. He brings Noah along. And then after they rebel and they still do Babel or Babylon is what it really is, uh, we find the, the Abraham narrative. So all of a sudden, we've gone from some seed is coming from, from Adam to now it's going to come from Abraham. And right. it gets more specific over time of who it is. And yet the blessings are for all of Israel. Uh, but there's somebody important that's coming from this line. Um, so that becomes a key theme too, is so we've right. got this theme of covenant <laughs> of something that's coming. Um, we've got a theme of a, a special line of the individual who will come in and uh, he will be, you know, strike, he'll, he'll be struck on the heel, but he'll strike the head of the serpent. Um, and so those are big deals in Genesis. Right. So here's what's really cool is, uh, 19 is where things kind of get interesting because in 19, if you read it, uh, and, and I will just kind of look at it on my software right now. Um, if you look at the chapter, something takes place in 19 and I've preached on this. And I teach on this a lot. This is not original to me who found it. It's, it's from Sailhammer. Um, but what happens is, so God tells them, right? Uh, he says in the first set of verses in 19, he says in verse three, um, uh, or, or verse four, you've, you, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you. Yeah, you have a paper copy. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> brought you to myself. Now, if you'll carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, uh, you'll be my own possession out of all the peoples. Although the whole earth is mine, you'll be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. And these are the words you're to say to the Israelites. So this is interesting in here. So it appears that what God is about to do is reinstitute this relationship in the same way that Adam and Eve were, were priests, so to speak, of the garden, that they were God's representatives over the entire earth at that time. Uh, God at this point in 19 uh, is ready to do that with Israel. He's ready to bring them in and to restore that relationship that was lost there. Um, that's what he wants to do. He wants to make them a kingdom of priests. Now, something takes place, though, in 19 that changes everything. And so it's interesting. He tells them that, get ready. We're going to come up the mountain um, at the sound of uh, when I come. In not, verse 9, so I'm going to go up to a dense cloud. Uh, the people will hear when I speak with you and will always believe you. And you're going to get people ready. And then he says, 
Uh, don't go up the mountain or touch it. And verse 12, anyone who touches will be put to death. Uh, but then he says in verse 13, when the ram's horn blasts, then you can go up. So the, God's ready to take them up to sound Sinai and make this covenant with all of them. Um, which is a really cool thing to think about, right? That they're about to be brought back in to this land. He's going to have this new relationship with this people. Um, then you get to 16. Six, something happens here. On the third day when the morning came, there was thundering and lightning. And on the mountain, a very loud blast from the ram's horn. All the people in the camp shuddered. Verse 17, it says, Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on fire. Its smoke went up, lit like a smoke in the furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. And as the sound of the ram's horn grew louder, God, Moses spoke and God answered him. And the Lord came down to Mount Sinai, verse 20, and the Lord summoned Moses to the top, and he directed, Go down and warn the people not to break through to see the Lord. Otherwise, they will die, even the priests who come near. And then he goes in verse 23 and says, they can't come up, okay? Weird, because I thought he was going to bring them up and make a covenant with them, and now he says, only Moses, nobody else. Now, here's what's interesting. The next chapter is given the Ten Commandments. And right after that, 18 goes back and says what took place prior to Moses going up. All the people witnessed the thundering lightning, the sound of the ram's horn, verse 18, the mountain enveloped in smoke. And when they saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. You speak to us and we will listen. They said, but don't let God speak to us or we will die. See, what, what it appears is going on in this story is God was ready to be with them. In fact, he didn't even give them anything yet up to this point. Remember in the first set of verses, he says, if you'll obey me and keep my covenant, what covenant? There's nothing, there, there's no rules or anything yet that he's been given to them. And he says, come on up. They don't come. You go, Moses. We don't want it. And so then what happens after that in the story is what? After that takes place, they're no longer a kingdom of priests they're a kingdom with priests and so you begin to see now that they the relationship's going to be different you're going to have priests that are going to have to go before you and god the priesthood is set up um and then there's there's some laws that are given and then not long after all those sets of laws are given what happens next well there's another narrative that comes kind of squished even in between these uh laws here and you begin to see, and you, the next big narrative here is the golden calf incident. And once you get the golden calf incident, then more laws are poured in and dropped in. And you see more and more. And then that's where you see, uh, you, you see uh, um, uh, you know, just this kind of pattern that begins to take place in the story where there is narrative and then narrative breaks and then laws are given. Um, you know, this, this concept, by the way, uh, it is something that there are um, rabbis that commented on uh, the fact that if this was really the law, if this was all about the law, why not start with the first givings of the law? Why not start with, you know, the first instructions are really about Passover and all of that too, right? Uh, right. But it doesn't. You give up all these stories in Genesis to get us to this point. Because there's a purpose. The story is telling us of where they came from. And then, boom, Salehammer used to call it, uh, drop it a bag of laws uh, on the story. And so that's what we see here is uh, all this stuff is they're given law after law after law. And then, boom, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get the golden calf incident. And then they're going to be given more laws. And then you pick up and you see, uh, you'll see this happen again. Uh, once you get into, um, you get into numbers, there's, there's, um, there's more sin that takes place, right? There, there's the strange fire incident, and then more laws are going to be given there too. Uh, in Leviticus, there is, Leviticus doesn't really have a lot of narrative, right. uh, but that, that pattern actually holds up. Um, there's a reference, I'm trying to remember where it is. Is the Kenites in there, or is that later? Uh, you know, I, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. The, 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 the thing I'm talking about are the, um, the, uh, when you get the, um, 
the, the, there's a weird reference to, and I'll find it uh, in Leviticus, of these, um, these goat idols uh, that are being worshipped. Um, and so you've got all these sacrificial laws and things like that that are being put in there. Uh, but then um, what God does is he, 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 there's this obscure little reference to Israel sacrificing uh, to, to the goat gods um, and I'm sure tr- the goat demons and um, man, where is that one? I'm going to look it up. I, I, I don't like doing this on the fly. Yeah, here we go. It's in chapter 17. So there's this discussion, right? And it says, uh, here's how the priest must do it. And then he says, they must no longer offer their sacrifices to the goat demons that they prostituted themselves with. This is a permanent statue for them throughout their generations. So you've got this reference to these, it seems like they were been sacrificing the goat demons. So there's, boom, all these more laws on sacrifices and how it has to go. And then you get into... Um, the number story in the Balaam narratives. And then soon after that too, you've got their downfall by Balaam and then more laws are given. And then Deuteronomy is really a recap. Uh, and, but it's this future progression of this, even as you get to the end of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30 is fascinating because Deuteronomy 30 at the end just says, you're never going to do it. You know, you're never going to be able to keep the law. Uh, you know, and you're going to fail is what it's pointing us to. Uh, and, but then God will come and, and bring you back at some point. Really, that's, that's what it comes to is that he'll come and, and it actually is pointing us to the new covenant when he talks about how uh, he'll come and he'll bring them back and how he was going to change their hearts too. Uh, and so you see all of that kind of stuff in the final chapters of Deuteronomy where he's talking about uh, that they're going to fail. It's inevitable. They're never going to be able to keep the law, but God one day will restore them and bring them back after they've gone into exile. So the book is not about so much focus on the law. The book is about how you can't keep the law and how uh, that God was going to have to do a work one day too. So as a New Testament guy, does that sound like, you know, stuff that that, you know, is New Testament related? Is that a New Testament kind of concept uh, that, that we see carried on? Is that an accurate reading of the Torah, uh, essentially, by a New Testament perspective? Yeah, you know, and that's, by the way, I meant Korah, not Kenite. Um, <laughs> so That's why I, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, but after that incident too, right, there's yeah. more laws that are going to be given because they've been challenged too. But uh, so... You know, I would say what I've, I've kind of, I didn't know uh, Dr. Selhammer in the same way. I, I knew of him, but I didn't have him as a teacher. But uh, it really opened my eyes. And what I, I enjoyed about reading Pentateuch of narr- Pentateuch's narrative and meaning of the Pentateuch was the, uh, the way it made sense of how Paul thinks of the Old Testament, and in, in particular, Paul. But we see it also in other places. Uh, in particular, you know, there's some pushback that, that we could give on, okay, you know, is it always, uh, you know, to summarize how I'm understanding, it's uh, narrative, God's moving us into a renewed union, uh, and then disobedience. More laws, narrative, disobedience, more laws, and so disobedience creates kind of a further uh, mediation, because as, as a result of those laws, we have mediation where instead of me going to God, I now have a priesthood. And yeah. um, even Moses can't then go into the tabernacle. Uh, he needs his brother to be the intercessor as the high priest. And so we end up farther and further away from uh, God. And so that for me is, is really what we see Paul saying in, again, Galatians 3, when he says that a mediator uh, is uh, not of one, but God is one. And so, um, and I'll go to there because that's a, a key point when Paul's talking about- It is, about, it really fits with this whole concept here. Yeah, uh, again, should have had all these verses, but just never sure- It's okay, we're man. Go. You know, it's this is okay. kind of casual, but uh, Galatians 3, 19 and 20, why the law? Why was it given? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Now, a mediator is not of one or for one party, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises? May it never be. For if the law had not been given, which would have been able to impart life, 
sorry, if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But scripture shut up everyone in disobedience, in sin, so that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. So I see this uh, really where the law's purpose is not redemptive, no. but rather um, as a, uh, a means, almost a band-aid, we're going to hold things together here until we can get the true solution. Uh, so what we find is that uh, even elsewhere, Paul will talk about how the law is given even to cause more transgression or that it, 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 it does cause more transgression because when we know the law, we're even more inclined to break it. So, um, and then what's this idea? So rather than you're my kingdom of priests, you know, that, that you're my special people that I'll have direct communication with, like God had with the patriarchs. Now we have this mediation that takes place and that mediation is not, uh, on the same level as what we have in Christ, because that mediation is not one, where God is one. And so some people will say, well, who's the mediator? Is that Moses? What does he mean by the hands of the angels? And I kind of went back into Deuteronomy and looked at the same Sinai sequence, and it, it does appear that you have um, an understanding that angels might have been present in the giving of the law. Uh, I think we have some Psalms that speak to that as well. But the the big deal is that we were looking for the seed, uh, and that's usually understood in progeny, but somewhere in the midst of all that, we have this folk on, focus on singularity, that, that there'll be one who will come from Abraham's body, that there is going to be um, a seed who will possess the gates of his enemies. You know, if we go to chapter 22 and the sacrifice of Isaac that doesn't happen, the blessing there uh, has a singular adjective attached to, um, you'll have more progeny than the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore but uh, your offspring will possess the gates of his enemies. Yeah. And so all of that in this book, by the way, which I love about it is because he catalogs all of these things too. <clears throat> well, and that's, uh, th those are the things. Then we get into um, the other prophetic stuff. Okay. So the seams, I don't know if you want to go into the seams. I wanted to go there right after this because you set it up perfectly talking about until until Christ came, right? That the focus right. is, so let, let's go to the seams, but I want to say this too. I mean, think about if the point of the Torah, if Moses wrote the Torah to just say, hey, everybody better obey these laws because that's what's going to save you, then why would he say really at the close of the book in chapter 31, he says this, verse 27, I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are uh, and, and, um, and if you are rebelling against the Lord now while I'm still alive, how much will you rebel after I'm dead? Uh, and then he goes on to talk about just that this is what's going to happen. He says this too in 29. He says, for I know that after my death, you will completely corrupt and, uh, and become completely corrupt and turn from the path I've commanded, on, uh, commanded you. Disaster will come on you in the future because you do what is evil in the Lord's sight, angering with, the, uh, with what your hands have made. So it's interesting uh, that, that that's what he's saying at the end of his book, essentially, is you're never going to do it. Right. You're going to be so terrible. So it's interesting as well that, uh, that he, um, he is, says that he's going to talk about in the future, they're going to fall away. Uh, and yet there's also another theme that is, happens in the Pentateuch, which is what you've just mentioned is these seams. Um, and we're talking about seams in the same way that like, if I was going to sew, I have a guy in my congregation who one of his jobs used to be, he would work in a fabric, uh, he would work for a fabric company and how do, um, he did the designs for how much fabric does it take to make each shirt, right? So okay. uh, I got a shirt here. How much can we print on a, on a piece of fabric and roll out because each one is a different piece. The shoulders are different pieces, the collar, all of that. And it's all got to get sewed together. And so then you have these seams that show where these store, where these pieces come together. Um, it's interesting that in the midst of this narrative that starts with God has made them, they've rebelled. Uh, he wanted time with them. And now he's trying to restore it and give them a place where he will live amongst them again in the land. And he still wants to do that, but they're too rebellious. They don't accept it. Uh, and even at the end, they're still going to fail. Uh, and he has to tell them in Deuteronomy 30 that one day after all that happens, he says in 30 verse 6, I'm going to circumcise your heart. Right. Uh, you know, So there is this failure and that God's going to have to do something. 
amidst all of that are these scenes. And the first one takes place in Genesis 49. Um, and it's a phrase that is used, and you often see it, for instance, in, I'm, using, I'm going to open up on um, the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, the Christian Standard Bible translates the phrase as in the days to come. But really what it is, is it means in the last days, fo focusing on this future event that's coming for Israel. Um, and he, so he, he, for instance, in 49, he talks about how, you know, what's going to happen to the tribes. And then he focuses on Judah. And he talks about how there's this individual, really the key is from Judah is verse 10. And he says, the scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right it comes and the obedience of the people belong to him. Talking about saying so that's this is going to be picked up throughout the Torah, right. the, the Tanakh. Of, there's one guy who all kingship belongs to, and he's going to come in the, in the end. And then he talks about verse you know, 11 and 12, the very New Testament. If you look at the image of Jesus in Revelation, of a, you know, he's, he's got his, his uh, garments dipped in red because he's been out on the, the wine press. But it's the same image that's picked up in Isaiah. It's picked up in Revelation of trampling his enemies uh, in the press. And so uh, that's the first scene is we talk about somebody who's going to come. It's very fascinating that this is this individual discussed. But there's another scene there too. Um, and the other one comes, the next big one comes in Numbers. There's 23 and 24. And, and when we talk about scenes, these are not just like, okay, here, let's find, they're, they're big poetic sections. Uh, it's different. So in the, the Torah has narrative and it's got poetry and then it's got law, all the legal material. So the these are big like, poems that are shoved in. There's a poem uh, that happens in, uh, I think it's Exodus 15, talking about what took place after that. But these are long sections that they begin by saying what's going to happen or within them talk about what's going to happen in the last days. And so the same thing is picked up by Balaam. Uh, and he says, verse uh, chapter 24, verse 14, and Christian Standard translates it. What's going to happen to them in the future? And what does he say there? And he talks about, uh, I, I love it. Verse 17, I see him, but not now. I perceive him, but not near. A star will come from Jacob. A scepter will rise from Israel. Uh, and he'll smash the forehead of Moab and strike down all the Shethites. So there's this individual who's going to come from Israel. He's going to have, you know, he's going to rule. He's going to bring judgment. Uh, amongst the nations, so to speak. Uh, and so that's what you, you begin to see are these, these themes that point things out like that throughout the story. Uh, and then you get to Deuteronomy, uh, and Deuteronomy uh, 31, uh, 29 gives us that last one. And that's what he says right there, right? I, I read it. It says what's going to happen to you in the future uh, it, because of how rebellious. And then he goes on into 32 and he starts telling them, uh, what kind of their story and all of this, but this all of it is here is this this feature um, that um, that somebody is coming uh, who is going to come and save the people uh, because of because of what's being discussed here. So uh, it's an interesting concept that uh, judgment is 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 coming, but also there's an individual who's going to be coming through, and it comes clear in these seams that there's a focus on somebody and also on the rebellious of the people though. So there you go, Mr. New Testament. What do you think? So, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think this is just really powerful. And again, in, in my dissertation, I focus mostly on, on Genesis and the seed there, but uh, what, what we see, especially with Paul is uh, in Galatians three, he's got this contrast of promise and law and the promise is superior to the law. We, we finish up Deuteronomy and God says, I'm going to have to do this myself. I'm going to have to circumcise your hearts myself. Same imagery we get from Jeremiah, who's going to have a, um, uh, the, the tablets of law uh, are going to be written on our hearts. He's going to uh, take out the hearts of flesh. And Ezekiel tells us we're going to have this new covenant. And so we have this language set up in the Pentateuch that there's a promise that's going to override the law. And the promise was made to the patriarchs. And because of that promise, God's going to see it through. And what we see in these poetic sections is kind of this, uh, you know, let's go, let's go Chriswell on this the scarlet thread that is tying yeah. 
um, our, our Pentateuch together through poetic focus. And these focuses are always on Israel, the people, but also on the one. And, uh, you know, in the middle of the Genesis 49 blessing, <clears throat> and a lot of, a lot of uh, professors, scholars will say that this last days doesn't mean last days, it's uh, days to come. And I, I completely reject that uh, <laughs> because that's, I don't think that's how they would have read it at the time. Uh, but a lot of people will look through these blessings of the tribes and try to play it out in Israel's history. And, and so they, they eliminate that eschatological uh, end of the world uh, possibility. But it says something about until Shiloh comes. Uh, yeah. So the blessings to Judah, there's two major blessings. There's uh, Judah and Joseph in Genesis 49. Judah is a lion's whelp from prey. My son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down like a lion as a lion who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him belongs the obedience of uh, the Goim, the peoples. And so we have this king from Judah who's going to be over his brothers and will be king over all the peoples. And uh, so who is this guy and, and what is Shiloh? So uh, when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran and the way that this was understood, it, the interpretation that seems to have more weight is that this is saying until one comes to whom it belongs that um, the, the letters and the, the markings can be read, transliterated as Shiloh, or it can be understood as uh, one coming, you know, and this is where my Hebrew fails me, but trust me that the letters with certain vowing can be understood this way. And you'll see other translations take it that way. And I, I argued that in Galatians 19 and, 3, 19 and 20, Paul is saying until the promised one should come, until the promised seed should come, uh, was kind of a tipping of our hat of what's going on in Genesis because he's following huh. this narrative progression. And so this one, again, Genesis 49 is picked up in numbers 23, 24. We have uh, 23, the blessings of Balaam uh, against his will that there's like a lion who dares rouse him. Uh, the, the chapter 23, the first uh, set of blessings is about the nation. They are like a roaring lion who dares rouse them. Then we move on and it's, he is like a roaring lion who, dares rouse him and it uh, plays with this corporate to singular idea and then we get to 24 and we have the star i see him now not, uh, so um and of course just for fun because i just talked about hosea the other day uh hosea when it says out of egypt i have called my son i believe he's reading that through numbers 23 and 24 and when matthew takes that and says uh the prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus having to go to Egypt because Hosea says, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Matthew is reading Hosea theologically through the lens of these seams in the Pentateuch that the Messiah was going to live the life of Israel. And just as Israel came from Egypt, the one coming out of Egypt, I have called my son, him individually in number 24 is the very one who Hosea is saying where Israel failed, the one will come. And that's how Matthew understands that prophecy to be fulfilled. So this is all over the New Testament, that they understood yeah. messianic passages embedded in the very Pentateuch and then accentuated in the prophetic writings. So two things about that. You know, one of the things I think is really fascinating is when you just read it as a narrative, it really becomes way more New Testament -y, New yeah. Testament ish than you ever thought, right? Because if you actually give it a shot to just read the story, and you just make a note like, okay, narrative ends here, boom, a bunch of laws come. Here's what the climax is. Here is how it ends. You read it and you really just kind of, a straightforward reading just kind of brings you to a point where you're like, oh crud. The New Testament's understanding is not, Paul's not pulling stuff out of thin air to try to make the Torah fit with, the, with Christianity. Paul's reading the Torah as it stands and saying that the Torah, Moses wrote it this way to show us that we, and it's the same way that Jesus can say, if you, Moses wrote about me, and, right. and, and he says in another place, you know, your witness against you will be Moses, you know, and then it talks about in Luke uh, 24, talking about how he started with Moses, and then uh, the prophets in the Psalms walks them through the story about him, and so uh, it, it really is. Do, if, if I believe that Jesus is right in saying that Moses wrote about him, um, I think that's a really fascinating thing to see is that he's there, he's discussed. And that messianism in the Old Testament, in the Torah, is a whole other topic of discussion. But I think it's, 
it's, it's something to say is that Moses had that, when Paul says he was writing about it too, is Moses' whole point is Israel failed. God has to do something else in the future. Uh, they haven't obtained it yet. By the way, when you talk about the last days, in the beginning, verse 1, uh, Salem points out it, it, it's, it's in the beginning, but it has to have a end to it. And the end, those last days, correspond to it. So he's talking about this beginning and he's saying that it's going to finish at some point. It's going to have an end to it all. Which, by the way, what's really pulled me towards seeing this as really finality to at the end of time has been my own study in Daniel. Uh, because the phrase is picked up too in chapter two. Even though it's in Aramaic, it's the same thing, telling uh, Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the last days. And in the last days, God's kingdom will be set up and will crush all of the other kingdoms. Uh, and, and so I think there's something very much to all of this, that we're not just looking at a, a if we're looking at uh, the millennial reign of Christ that will come and put an end to everything too, uh, as, as part of that. And, and you can parcel out you know, when does the kingdom start and all of that? But I think a lot of this is the end when Christ sets his kingdom up and rules through everybody as well. Yeah, and I, I would say it's, a, it's imperative that Christians read the Pentateuch this way because you miss, you miss so much. And, and that's the world. I took a class at the U of A, University of Arizona, and I was told that, you know, Genesis 3 is just a story that ended up in this larger work. And the point is why it hurts to have babies, why we hate snakes, and why we, uh, we have to work all the time. And that's, that's all there is to Genesis 3. And it's because it's being read totally in isolation. It's ignoring its greater context. And uh, it's ignoring the way that the book was put together and understood for all of human history. And that's very popular for the modern secular world to try to break things apart. Sometimes because we do Sunday school this way, and uh, we have, we, if you grew up in the church, you grew up hearing these stories and singing, Father Abraham had many sons, right arm, left arm, one of my favorites, by the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, Father Abraham, it's, it's imperative that, to realize when, when he's called, I'm going to bless you, and everyone who blesses you will be blessed, and in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed, that there's a reason that God's blessing the world. And that's because they are all under a curse. And that this whole moment when Abraham is called is, is so crucial because God says, this, this is not over. This is how it's going to continue. This is how I'm going to bring it about. And uh, so we, we stand in a need of blessing because we have inherited a curse. And that, that is how the New Testament reads it. That they read it as a, as a progressive story and they, they walk you through this understanding of God. And so it's important to know the stories. Most Christians don't even know the stories. Uh, those that know the stories have to understand that they're part of a grand meta narrative of God's salvation work. So, you know what's interesting? It's something I never even heard until I started reading, once again, reading Moses, seeing Jesus. Something he brings up, it's this, it's kind of a Jewish way of reading things. And he, he calls it, it's a phrase that they use. Um, and he, he's, it's Messiah uh, votes Simon Labanim. There you go. No, but what, essentially what it means is, uh, is the deeds of the father are signs to the sons. Um, and so it's the point is that these are stories that we read that are to tell the sons, uh, to teach them about something that's going to happen to them in the future. He says, uh, Moses wrote these stories about the patriarchs, not to tell us about the patriarchs and those who preceded them, but to tell us about what would happen to the descendants of those patriarchs. Uh, i.e. the nation of Israel in the future. Though some scholars use this Hebrew phrase, others identify uh, the literary feature as narrative typology. Uh, and so uh, it, it's interesting that, that he is saying, and one of the things we need to do is read these stories too, and I, I think he's spot on, uh, is we read these stories of saying, these are all glimpses of what is going to happen in the future. So in the same way that things, these stories that happened with Adam being kicked out, Israel be kicked out, uh, but in the future, God is going to try to restore, and we're going to see him do that again. Um, so I, I think that's a cool little thing to think about how these stories relate to. What are the purpose? purpose? These Genesis stories are there to tell the story of what would happen to Israel, how they got into the boat that they got into in the first place, um, and, um, 
you know, uh, so it, it's just, it, it's something that I think you're right. We, we need to see Genesis. We need to see the whole Torah as a story. And I think that's how you read it. We get so lost on what does this law do? Is this law for me? And that's another lecture, another video uh, sometime to just sit and say, how do we, re how do we deal with these laws? Like, why is it okay for me to eat a ham sandwich and a, you know, and a bacon wrapped shellfish? Um, but, you know, I, I have, I also claim certain, you know, uh, principles are still relevant in the Torah. You know, that's a whole nother discussion. Right. Um, but I do think we do need to ask the question, like, what other book do you read and just say, well, I'm going to read the, the first chapter and I'm never going to read the rest of it. you like, or what other books do you read where you're like, oh, I'll pick the middle one. I'm not going to read the rest of the story. Like, we don't do that. We read the beginning and the intro and we read all the way to the conclusion. Uh, that's how a book should be read. And yet with the Pentateuch, sometimes we start with the intro, Genesis. We never read anything else. We don't think about the story past that. We don't think about what it's trying to teach us or what the high point is or what the end is. We just shut our brains off uh, and we look at it as just section. We section it out. Uh, but that's a problem, I think, with most, I would just say American reading. It's probably much larger than Americans, but at least in our context, people just, the way we read the Bible, right? I mean, I don't have a physical copy near. I'll just, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just pretend this is one. So if this were a Bible, right, here's my Bible reading of the day and boom, I'm in this chapter. And, uh, but I don't have any sense of the storyline. Right. And that's something I think is the storyline. It, 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 it's something that beyond the Pentateuch needs to be understood is what is the storyline of the Old Testament, right? It, it, when you grasp what the storyline of the Old Testament is, you understand why the New Testament fits so well. Right. When you don't have a grasp of the storyline, then you're able to say things like, oh, we don't need it. Unhitch ourselves. You've got to grasp what the overall narrative is and why we are in the, why we, why we even need a New Testament. Truth is you follow the storyline. Genesis, De Deuteronomy 30 already tells you why you need a New Testament because God has to do a new work and do something in the hearts of his people. Get a little passionate. That's right. That's right. Right. And, uh, and Christians need to quit undercutting our legacy and our heritage. Learn the New Testament, learn the Old Testament, because every one of the Old Testament, every one of the New Testament writers, when they say the word scripture, they're, they're saying, hey, that, that Old Testament, you know. And uh, of course, the word testament also means covenant. And I think a lot of people, when they're saying New Testament, we're, we're not saying the New Testament. It's not even composed or collected yet. What we're saying is the New Covenant. We, we are New Covenant people because we are in the line of the old covenant may do in Christ. And so it, it's a single story. And the old covenant always pointed to the fact that it was, it was, I mean, you think about the book that is to, to seal the old covenant. If the focus is on the old covenant, Sinai in the Torah, and at the end of the Torah says, yeah, you're never going to keep this thing. Yeah. I mean, that should help you understand a little bit that even the old covenant itself understood it was not, going to work forever right it wasn't going to last and that's why the prophets pick up and that's where you get to jeremiah 31 uh we're talking about a new covenant that was going to come that's where ezekiel picks up and talks about now a heart of flesh and the the spirit of god residing in all of that's old testament concepts um but they're all looking at the law and how it was going to pass away or at least the covenant piece would pass away and um and the new make way for the new um, yeah, it's, it's when you read the text and try to track the storyline, you get this stuff and you're not having to pull. And the one thing I love about this understanding, Andrew, is the same thing you and I have talked about over and over is where I think there's a real snobbery in New Testament circles. And it's not because I'm an Old Testament guy, but the New Testament snobbery of this. Well, the apostles can read it that way because they're, they're inspired authors. As if Paul's understanding of the Pentateuch can be all cruddy and made up out of thin air because he's an inspired apostle. He can read it however badly he wants to. And I, that doesn't sit well. Now, they would never say it that way, but that's essentially what it means is Matthew can, can make up all sorts of things that Jesus is fulfilling prophecies like you brought up with Hosea. 
Right. And, and I think that that's a load of bull. Um, I think that r really it's, it, you have to really say, how are they reading it? Because that's the right way to read it. And if you just read it the way it was meant to be read, straight through, you see that stuff. You don't feel right. like they're having it. Uh, I'm gonna say go on a limb here. Without Galatians, I think I could still get that story with just reading the Pentateuch. Now, I'm glad Galatians comes in to clarify. I like having Paul to, to uh, confirm right. those things. Uh, but, that, but that's the point, is Paul's helping to shape that and to confirm it. He, he's not making it up for us. And, and, and he's not alone. You know, uh, the message of Stephen is a narrative story of the, the people of Israel. And uh, he breaks off kind of midway and says, don't you see? <laughs> You know, how long will you harden your hearts, stiffen your hearts? You have uh, Paul talking about, again, the promises, uh, the, um, the blessings that we have uh, to Abraham uh, being applied again in this current context. You, you have Romans, which says a lot of the same things of Galatians. Uh, you have Peter, who puts us in the story. The diaspora people of Israel is now us. Uh, and, and we, uh, Peter calls us the, the nation of priests. Right. Where does that language come from? Well, it was rejected at 19 of Exodus. Right. And in chapter 24, verse 7 and 8, when they said, we will obey, and he sprinkles them with the blood, that is the opener to Peter, where you have been uh, called by God, you're consecrated by the Spirit, and now you are um, cleansed by the Son for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So where they failed to keep the law, we don't even have a lot to keep. We just, we're just obedient to Jesus and we're sprinkled by his blood. So we stand in that story. We, we're, the, we're the new start. We're the new covenant. And what we have that they didn't have is a living Holy Spirit uh, in us. And so that, that is the, the change maker. So no, I, I, think it's, I think it's fantastic. It's awesome. And I'm hoping people will say, wow, I never thought about reading the Bible this way. I, I, hopefully this is opening some eyes. I, I, you know, I'll tell you something else that stands out um, is little verses too. when we read this uh, in the Pentateuch. I want to give you one more thing, and I can't, I'm going to find it really quickly. Um, it's the stories of Abraham. Um, and, it, you know, just the idea that, um, that Abraham, let me look for my notes, that even the Pentateuch itself talks about how um how that moses out of all the people right like moses doesn't even make it into the land he's the one who gives but it's interesting um this i want to let me read this one verse to you because i think this is another one to just add to the fuel of this discussion of does the law is the purpose of the torah to tell you obey all the laws or is it tell you a group of people that were so bad and God had to give them more laws and he has to say, I'm going to do something new, right? Uh, Genesis uh, 26 is interesting. Um, there's the promise that's being referred to Isaac. Here's what he says. Um, he goes on and he says, uh, after he says he's going to give the land to him, he says, I'll make your descendants, verse four, as numerous as the stars of the sky. I'll give your offspring all these lands, all the nations will be blessed by your seed, your seed man. You got this. But then look what he says in verse five, because Abraham listened to me and he kept my mandate, my commands, my statutes and my instructions. Um, what laws and instructions and statutes and commands did Abraham have? Well, I think what Moses is telling us is Abraham didn't have the law. And yet he is seen as somebody who kept the law. Uh, why? Because it's about his faith, right? It's, it's, uh, you see that Abraham in Genesis 15, it says that he, when he believed God, he was counted as righteous. Um, that's essentially the whole point is you highlight Abraham versus Moses. Moses right. is given the law. Even the law guy who helps give the law can't keep it. Abraham, prior to the giving of the law, has a special relationship with God. He has a faith with God. And then he even tells his son, he kept all of my commandments. And it's like, whoa. When, when any reader of the story knows that's not true. <laughs> yeah. That's what do you true. mean it's not? What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, where, where's, the, where's all the laws? So, no, so, it's because he so, had faith. Clearly, you know? we, within 12 chapters, we haven't forgotten that Abraham has done all kinds of things that, that messed this up. 
But yeah. at the end of the day, he's like David. And, and that's where Paul says exactly what you're saying in Romans 4 with uh, the gospels pre-preached to Abraham in Genesis uh, 15, 4, that uh, he believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. And even David says, how blessed is the one whose sins are not counted against them. So in the one way, God counts righteousness into Abraham's account and doesn't count his unrighteousness against him. And that is the gospel pre-preached. And so th that is exactly the kind of thing that we're, we're talking about. So it's awesome, man. It just, <laughs> it really does. It blows your mind how incredibly gospel-ish the Pentateuch really is when you just closely read it. Um, the, I, I really do think if you're willing to closely read it, as it is, and just kind of take notes, you're going to see this stuff and you're going to, you're going to, you need to at least put an asterisk next to something and, you know, put a question mark because it's going to be answered later on too. that kind of stuff. So it is, it's fascinating how much gospel and new covenant related that the, especially the first five are uh, pointing us towards the new, you know, Good conversation, Andrew. I've enjoyed this one today. I, I think so. I hope, hope everybody's sticking with us. And again, we could go for two, three more hours. Uh, and but that's why we can do later shows. If, if the Lord tarries, Ben. As James would say, yeah, the, if, as the Lord wills, we will, we will have more. But if the truth is, I just like doing this. So like if it was just you and me continuing to do this, that could be just lots of fun. But we don't have to. We know at least you know, somebody. Maybe one day these are what will be used in the Left Behind series. When That's we're right. all gone, it's these. <laughs> Here well, you go, Kurt Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> you want to close this out with our uh, Pentateuch blessing? Let's do it. And as it comes from the Torah, uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. All right, guys, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for watching another episode of OTXNT. Old Testament, Christ, New Testament. Have a great day. Goodbye. See you later. <laughs>